Good morning, everybody. Second core. That comes after Marine Corps. Second core. Second Corinthians 11. Learning about the beguiling serpent. <clears throat> How he beguiles people. His subtlety. He's a deceiver. He, uh, the word subtle has the letter B in it. And you'd never know it. Because it's very subtle. That's right. The letter B in the word subtle is very subtle. You'd never know it. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 11. Come on, everybody laugh a little bit. Come on, smile, be happy. Or they'll legalize marijuana in Missouri. We don't want that, do we? No. It's not, listen, it's not working in Colorado. Um, people are driving under the influence and wrecking their cars and every insurance sky. When will people learn? Sin costs. Amen? Sin has a cost attached to it. It has a price attached to it. Uh, the cost in medical bills, the cost in uh, damage to homes, to property, to cars, to people, the cost in relationships, uh, and the cost in, it'll cost you eternal life. That's what it costs you. And uh, fortunately, Christ paid the price for eternal life, but the medical bills are on us. Mm -hmm. Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, and this is the, this is the end game right here. Here's the target. Here's the goal. The, the subtlety of the serpent has a purpose attached to it. There's a reason why. And that reason is... He that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached. Or if you receive another spirit, whom ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Uh, if you look on down over to uh, verse 15, or verse 13, for in the same chapter, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You know what I'll do? Uh, in fact, verse 15, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. I want you to look at verse 14. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Then I want you to go back to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. The King James Bible, which I'll be using today, and tomorrow, and 30 years from now. The King James Bible in Isaiah 14 is the only Bible. The only Bible that ascribes the name of Lucifer to the devil. It's the only one. The New American Standard doesn't, uh, the NIV does not, the New English Version does not, the Holman Christian Standard Version does not. Uh, no others use this title Lucifer. They all use uh, something similar to Morningstar, which to me, just all that does is aggravate me and make me very angry. The Morningstar is Jesus. The Morningstar is not the devil. Okay? It's not. Um... Isaiah 12, Isaiah 14, 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, 
son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Does anybody know what the word Lucifer means? Does anybody know what it means? Light bearer. Lucy from the, the Latin word lucent or lucid. If someone is lucid, that means the light is on. Okay? Uh, that means they're sober and the light is on. Lucifer, um, the name Christopher is similar to that. Christopher means bearer of Christ. Uh, Christopher Columbus was realized what his name meant. Christopher, he, he saw himself as bearing Christ to the West Indies, all right? That's what he wrote in his diary. Anyway, that's what the word Lucifer means. It means a bearer of light. And Lucifer, prior to him falling from his estate, um, shined, it's just, just what we get from the name, that he bore the light of God, that he carried that light, or he was a reflection of that light, Lucifer. The question is, did the King James translators use the right term? In the Hebrew word is halal, which simply means bright. Okay, that's the simple form of it. It means bright, all right? Something that's bright. Did the King James translators pick the right word, Lucifer, when they did this? I think they did. Because the word Lucifer and 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. An angel is a messenger or a carrier, a bearer of light. So the name Lucifer in Isaiah 14, 12 matches what Paul said of Satan in 2 Corinthians eleven. 14, when it calls him an angel of light, a bearer of light. He's transformed into an angel of light, which means that he looks and appears as if he is light, but he's not. He's darkness, okay? He is, he is pure darkness, but he transforms himself and thus deceives people into thinking that he is the light of God or that he is the bearer of the light of God or whatever. But he deceives people that way. They're looking at darkness and calling it light. These people that, I, I watched the news this morning and I just was watching the people. They had a, a video of the people lined up to get marijuana in Las Vegas. Okay, These people are thinking that they're doing the right thing. They're thinking that they are that marijuana is great, that marijuana is the cure-all. I have people that I've seen on Facebook who pretend to be Christians, who promote the use of marijuana. Okay? Oh, it, oh, it cures it. God grew it. You hear that? God grew it. That means it's got a use for it. God put it on this earth. God's got a use for it. Yeah, they made rope out of it. Okay? Uh, anyway. So anyway, that's just my little thing there. I think Lucifer is, matches that angel of light phrase that Paul used in 2 Corinthians 11. All right, let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about Lucifer uh, and go to Proverbs chapter 23. This is sort of where we picked up and left off last week. Uh, we were talking about serpents and their poison. Serpents and their poison. One of the things that I believe the, the serpent did to Eve in the Garden of Eden was he poisoned her with his words. Do words, do, do words corrupt and poison people's minds? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is why I'm such, a, uh, I'm such a stickler for be sure that what you believe comes from God. If, if a preacher can talk you into something, somebody else can talk you out of it. They can corrupt your mind. If God talks you into something, it's not going anywhere. Okay, it sticks, it stays. Nobody's, nobody's going to take it away from you. So, in so I think the serpent poisoned Eve with his words. And the Bible bears that out. Proverbs 23, 31. Look not 
Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things. So I want you to, and I was sort of ending with this last week. I want you to think of number one, real wine or strong drink that people drink. And it does exactly what the Bible says it does. I would include, as far as intoxicants are concerned, wine, strong drink, marijuana, LSD, heroin, cocaine, any of these drugs, any of these, marijuana is a drug, any of these things that alter consciousness that alter sober thinking. The Bible calls on us to be sober. Nowhere, and I mean nowhere, does the Bible teach us that being drunk, either physically or spiritually, is right. Nowhere does the Bible teach that. Doesn't say it. You, in fact, you just look. Well, Jesus, and I hear this, Jesus made wine and the apostles all drank. And they want you to think that the apostles all got together and they had beer and wine and coolers and everything else. They had a big party when they got together. It's a bunch of nonsense. Wine bites like a serpent, stings like an adder. Your eyes behold strange women. Your heart shall utter perverse things. Notice that it says your heart shall utter these things, not your mouth. Because they come from the heart. The thing, you may have, watch this now, you may have things that you're holding inside of you that should never see the light of day. When you drink, what happens to those things? They come out. Things that should never be said. Things that should never be talked about. They are in your heart. And while you're sober, you have the ability to hold these things in. When you are drunk, they come out. You'll splatter them all over town because you're drunk. All right? Your heart shall utter perverse things. Isaiah 28, 7. This is concerning the prophets and the priests of Ephraim. They also have erred through wine. And I have up on the screen, I have the word erred underlined. All right? Maybe a little hard to see. Let me make my, I like my new app now because I can make my verses bigger. How is that? Does that look better? Okay. I have the word erred underlined. They erred through wine. That means they have gone into error because of wine. They've made mistakes. To me, the doctrine that the Bible contains errors, that doctrine since it doesn't come from the Bible, which is new wine, it comes from corrupted wine or strong drink. It is a spirit, a spirit, a drunken spirit of corruption that says that there are errors and mistakes in the Bible. And that's what reading the Bible is what causes people to go to into error because there are errors and mistakes in the Bible. And I do not believe that. The Bible does not teach that. Show me the verse. Again, show me the verse where it says there's errors in the Bible. There's mistakes in the Bible. There ever would be. There ever was. There is no place in the scripture teaching you that there should be errors in the Bible that we could ever expect to find a mistake in the word of God. I spent... A lot of time last night, about this time of year, I do the same thing. I have a book uh, written by a St. Louis guy, Bill Federer, uh, called America's God and Country. Amen. And um, when I read the quotations, and the thoughts, and the letters, the speeches made by some of our founding fathers, I weep. In some cases, I rejoice. Because what I did, and I did this for the message this morning, uh, I have it in PDF form, 
And I have the ability to search it. So I typed in the word Bible to see what our founders said about the Bible. You know, you'd shake, when you read it, you'd just shake your head and go, where, where did we go wrong? Mm -hmm. yeah. What our founding fathers believed about the Bible. In, I'll, just, I'll just tell you this. Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, as far as Christianity is concerned, not Christians. Both of them burning in hell right now. Okay? No doubt in my mind about it. Jefferson was a deist, which means he believed that, yes, there is a God. He created the universe, but he doesn't do anything. Okay? He, he doesn't touch it. He doesn't have any place in it. Benjamin Franklin uh, was a drunkard and a fornicator. And here's this fat, long-haired guy with glasses going to France, whining and dining all these ladies in France. But it was, it was Franklin and Je it was Jefferson who promoted the use of the Bible in the armed forces. Saying we can't, we can't do it without the Bible. Okay? I mean, these guys, as far as Christianity is concerned, were very bankrupt. But they knew the power of the Word of God. And I don't get, I don't understand that, how they could realize that the Bible had that much power and yet not believe it themselves. Okay? I mean, I don't understand it, but that was the spirit of the day. And our founding fathers, going all the way back to the early 1600s and forward, had a high regard for the sacred book, they called it, the scriptures. Okay? And they never believed that the Bible had errors in it. They all believed that it was the word of God. Okay? They believed it to be the word of God. Um, man by the name of Fisher Ames. Does anybody know who that is? He was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. And Fisher Ames um, was also part of the, um, what am I trying to say? The Constitutional Convention. When they were writing their Constitution. And they had, the, they had the first seven articles of the Constitution written up, but uh, they started passing it around and people said, we need more. So that's when they started working on the Bill of Rights. And Fisher Ames is the guy who came up with the wording for Congress shall, how is it concerning freedom of religion? Congress shall make no law establishing any religion nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. It was Fisher Ames who came up with that wording. And all the judges now want us to think that our founders had a strict separationist idea when it came to religion and matters of the state. But Fisher Ames, himself, the guy that wrote that, Fisher Ames himself said, we should have a Bible in every school desk. Amen. If we're going to teach children English, they should learn the English of the Bible. What Bible? That's, one, that's the only one they had. Okay? Some of them had access to the Geneva Bible, but it was not in much use at the time of the founding of our nation. It was a King James Bible. And Fisher Ames was one of many of our founders who said we should have Bibles in every school desk in our new nation. And we should teach children the Ten Commandments. We should teach them the Beatitudes. We should teach them the Proverbs. The McGuffey Readers. The early um, reading books in our nation was loaded with Bible verses out of the King James Bible. Chil imagine that. Children growing up in our nation reading Bible verses. It did not hurt us. We did not legalize marijuana and sodomite marriage. While children were reading out of a King James Bible in their schools. So you see, there is a spirit in this nation. And it is an, intoxicate, an intoxicating spirit. It is a drunken spirit that is promoting. I mean, we're celebrating July 4th. How are 90% of people in this country celebrating it with? Bud Light. And whiskey. And vodka. And marijuana. Okay, it's the same. Well, it doesn't matter if it's in the church. Doesn't matter if it's in 
Uh, the congressional halls doesn't matter if it's in the backyard. It is the same spirit. Um, Isaiah 28 again. They have also erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. What is the way? It's Christ. He is the way, the truth, the life. The Bible is the way of God. And so we have the prophets. Isaiah 28 is specifically geared toward the prophets and the priests. In other words, the men behind the pulpits. And the Bible scholars. Through strong drink, they are out of the way. And which means that they do not follow the Bible when it, when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to righteousness, when it comes to morality, they do not follow the Bible. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. When you err in vision, this is why drunk people should not drive cars. They cannot see right. They err in vision. This is why the preachers should not have a drunken spirit on them or in them because they will err in vision. They will say, well, I don't see it that way. This is what they'll say. When it comes to two men holding hands in their church, in their congregation, get, wanting to get married in that church, that pastor will marry them because they err in vision. They will say, I don't see anything wrong with that. Well, if you'd read the Bible, you would. No, I'll say, if you would read the King James Bible, you would. They stumble in judgment. Stumble causes you to what? So what spirit is going to bring about a falling away? That spirit. The poison of the serpent. Look up on the screen. Rodney Howard Brown, several others. They call Rodney Howard Brown the Holy Ghost bartender. Okay? Now again, I just want you to know this is not anything aged in a barrel. It's just tea. Okay? <laughs> I got to say that. People are going, what's he drinking up there? Rodney Howard Brown and I, and I had, when we had a school here, we had a bunch of families from one of these types of churches. And they were encouraging me that I needed to go see him when he came into St. Louis. And I went, nah, no thank you. And they were very condescending. They said, well, we've had a lot of your kind of people come. Really? They felt that I was inferior because I didn't do that. And there's this idea that these people teach that... You, when you get a dose of the Holy Ghost, that you become drunk in the Spirit. And they have these services whereby these people, they just fall, they laugh, it's called holy laughter. And it's a drunken stupor that it puts these people in. I've seen video clips, I've showed them here a long time ago. But I've seen video clips of people that have convulsions even days after these services. I mean... Literally spasms and convulsions that they have no control over. That's a spirit. That's not right. The Holy Ghost does not cause you to fall down and be drunk. The Holy Ghost causes you to stand when everybody else is falling down. Amen. Amen? That's the kind of spirit that the devil brings into churches and nations and homes and everywhere else. Okay? It used to be a serious crime. When I was a kid in this country, it used to be a serious crime to be caught with marijuana. You go to jail for that for a long time. Now they're writing tickets. Here you go. No big deal. Here you go. Now, in some states, it's not even against the law. What was the... By the way, what do you think the purpose of legalizing marijuana in the state of Nevada was? What do you think the real purpose was? Money. Instead of the street vendors selling it and keeping all the cash, now the state taxes it. Yeah. And gets, what, is, what does Nevada need with more money? They, listen, they tax everybody's sins for... Uh, Prostitution to be next in Nevada. Prostitution to be next. Then you'll know that it was the spirit of whoredoms 
and drunken spirit. Because remember, Babylon is a whore, but she holds a glass in her hand, a cup. And with it, she has made all the nations drunk with the wine of her fornication. Okay? That's, that's the kind of spirit. That's the poison of the serpent. That's what happens when he is allowed to do his thing. In Psalm chapter 58, uh, I'll let you turn there for a minute. Psalm, yeah, turn to Psalms. We've got a couple verses there I want you to see. Psalm 58, verse 4. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear. Notice that it ascribes a gender to the, to the adder. What gender is that? Female. Her. That's Babylon. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. Um... Poison equals doctrine or certain teachings that do not coincide with what the Bible says. They do not agree with what the Bible says. Psalm 140 verse 3. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. Selah, which means think about that. By the way, look up there on the screen. The serpent has a different tongue than you and I. It's a forked tongue. What do the uh, American Indians say about the white man? He speaks with a forked tongue. What does that mean? He lies. He says one thing, but he means another. Okay? And God... There's no doubt that God gave the serpent a forked tongue for that reason. To show us that typology, that picture. They've sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. And then um, in Romans chapter 3. In fact, let's turn to Romans 3 for a minute. Let's kind of get the gist of what he's saying here. Let's go back to verse 10 in Romans 3. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. So who is they? They is everybody. Because every person, every man, woman, child on this earth um, have no righteousness in them. They do not understand, they do not, their flesh, their body, they do not seek after God. Their soul might, but their flesh doesn't. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. In verse 13, their throat is an open sepulcher. What is a sepulcher? What is a sepulcher? It's a tomb. Okay, It's an open sepulchre, and what that means is there's dead things in it. Alright? What does your, your throat smell like? <laughs> like an open sepulchre. Okay? And this Bible's right, amen? With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. What is one thing common amongst pretty much all lost people? They curse. They curse. Use curse words. Swear. Now more than ever. Used to be you didn't hear things like that in public. Bars and Navy ships and stuff like that. Now it's everywhere. Men, women. Teenagers, even children. And they do it in public, not afraid. Children cursing right in front of their parents. No, no fear whatsoever. 
Okay? Their, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And basically, Paul here is describing the condition of lost people. This is how they are. So when it comes to the ability to lie, the ability to say things that are wrong, and the ability to lie about God and lie about His Word, that condition falls upon everyone that is lost, everyone that is not saved. Um, some things, you, several things you cannot trust from lost people. Number one, you cannot trust that lost people are going to say all the right things about God. They're not going to say it. They're not going to tell the truth. So should, should we read commentaries on the Bible written by lost people? No. What about listening to music and lyrics that are written about God by lost people? And to be honest with you, there's a, I wouldn't say that it's a majority, but there is a percentage of what would be called Christian music nowadays that is written by people that are not even saved. That to me is not Christian music. Christian music is written by a Christian Amen. who wants to preach the gospel in music, wants to extol God in music. Amen? And there's nothing wrong with that either. Not a thing. Um, now back to uh, the book of James chapter 3. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So the bottom line here is, is that their words bring death and not life. Their doctrine, their teaching... Their uh, mannerisms, their way, their services and things like that, they bring death and not life. They teach doctrines whose ways are the ways and the steps down to hell itself, not the way to heaven. All right? That was the bell, wasn't it? Let me read this very quickly. Jer and then we'll be done with this part of it. Jeremiah 8, verse 16. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones. For they are come and have devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell therein. For behold, I will send serpents, cockatrices among you, which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. Now remember what happened with the Israelites in the book of Numbers when they complained and murmured against God. God sent serpents in to bite them. Those serpents are, the, and the biting of those serpents was a type of, and especially Israel right now, being under a spirit of false doctrine and false teaching. That deal that I have up on the screen there <clears throat> is basically the core of Judaism as it stands right now. They believe in what's called the Kabbalah, mysticism. Basically, they're worshiping Ashtaroth and Baal under different names. They say they're worshiping God, but they're not. They're worshiping the serpent. And they freely, in some cases, will admit that they worship the serpent because the spirit of the serpent has bitten them. They are, they are under false doctrine and false teaching right now. And they spread that false teaching and that false gospel through churches in various ways. One of them is through the Hebrew Roots Movement. Remember what I said. To go to a lost man, to have him teach you anything about God, you're asking for trouble. And so when I hear about these guys that are going to these Jewish rabbis, trying to find out who the real Messiah is, they're not going to understand anything about who the Messiah is. These people are lost. They're blinded in part. They hung the Messiah on the cross. It's the same spirit that is in them that was in the people 2,000 years ago. And to think that these people, boy, they've got the goods on who the real Messiah is, that's a big lie. And a lot of people are falling for it. Way too many as far as I'm concerned. Somebody say amen. amen. Father in heaven, teach us true doctrine. 
Teach us the pure doctrine from the Word of God. Father, teach us things that have not been corrupted by either man or serpent. Teach us holy things. Teach us holy living. Teach us, Father, how to avoid unrighteousness in our life and call it good. Teach us, Heavenly Father, Lord, how to think right and act right and be right. Turn us not over, Lord, to the same spirit that we see all over this country, a drunken, harlot spirit. Turn us not over to that. Father, turn us to righteousness and to the truth. We ask this today in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.